What's up, kings and queens? Welcome back to Bad Habits Kingdom. Thank you guys so much for being here and supporting the channel and subscribing. We appreciate it so much. You have no idea. We love you so much for doing that. We are at 1,764 subscribers right now. That is so amazing, guys. Let's give it a clap. Let's give it a clap. I am so happy about that. Never thought in a million years I would ever have 1,700 subscribers. So I'm really proud of that number. A lot of people are like, well, you need to get a million. You need 50,000. I love my 1,700 subscribers. So I just want to make that very clear. Thank you so much. And if this is your first time on the show, do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button and the like up. Okay, we definitely need more support, of course. But... What you can also do is go on Spotify, go on Apple, go on TikTok, go on Instagram, go on everything. We are there. We are there. Bad Habits Kingdom is there. So if you're not able to watch the show, you can listen to it on Spotify and Apple while you're at work or when you're working out or when you're driving. Whatever. We are there, baby. All right, kings and queens. Tonight's show. Oh, before I get ahead of myself. First things first, as of always, if you hear any yelling, screaming, or breaking, that is my almost two-year-old daughter, Luna. She likes to be part of the show, and when I don't include her, she gets a little upset and starts breaking the cameras and tearing down lights. You, you, you know how it goes if you have a child. So, Again, me and my queen, or my queen and I, sorry, should you know have better grammar, um... We'll be going to the Children's Hospital, take toys for the kids at the end of the month. If you would like to help donate towards that cause, go to the GoFundMe account in the link below. Every donation counts. $5 goes a long way. We can buy a couple toys with $5. But all of your donations will be going to the for, to purchase toys for the kids here in Las Vegas at the Children's Hospital. That is our goal right now. So go ahead and donate. Every donation counts. Also, if you would like a free Bad Habits Kingdom t-shirt, all of our subscribers, especially our new ones, if you would like one, go ahead and email me at badhabitsking at gmail.com. Badhabitsking at gmail.com. That's emailing me personally. Let me know the size and where you want it sent to, and we will make sure we, we get you one on the next go around, which will be at the end of the month. Tonight's show, this is definitely a story that... When I first saw it, now I never read the book yet. I actually just purchased this, purchased the book online, and it'll be here in about three or four days. And then we're going to actually be doing another video. So this is actually part one of this story that I'm going to do. So if I don't have the uh, facts right or anything like that, I've just seen the movie and what I saw online on YouTube videos and what I read about online, stuff like that. But I am going to be reading the book here pretty soon, so I'm really excited about that. But this story, this movie, actually made me cry. This is the only, this is the second movie of my entire life that made me cry. Number one is Selena. I cried in Selena. Not going to lie, I was like 10 years old. J-Lo's still hot. But I was like 10 years old, and I cried my eyes out. I don't know why I was only 10, but when I saw Selena, I was bawling. And when I saw Lone Survivor. And I cried multiple times throughout this movie. Like, I was just like, I wasn't like bawling, but I had tears coming down. It was really painful for me. You know, when it comes to our military, I am very proud and very honored to even, you know, meet people in our military or talk about them. Or, you know, when I talk to people in our military or that used to be in our military, you know, it's it's a big honor to me. I love our military, all of them. You know, I love the Navy, Air Force. Marines, Army, you name it, I love it. National Guard. I I actually tried joining the military when I was like 17, 18, and I couldn't pass the ASVAB test, believe it or not. I tried like three different times, and I couldn't pass that test. I was like, man, I, I feel like a complete idiot. I can't, begin, I can't get into the military. I tried getting into the Navy. I tried getting into the Army, and I tried getting into the Marines. Three different times, three different ASVAB, failed them all. So when I realized, you know what, I'm just not worthy, I was totally okay with that because the men and women that serve in our military or has served is a huge honor to be part of that. And they are the ones that are worthy enough because our military to me is just so special. You know, I mean, they 
sacrifice years of their life if they're not in it forever or if they don't unfortunately pass away for us to make sure we can go to bed at night safe they give years of their life of all their life for us and it's a huge honor to me you know i i love our military to death this story uh is a very popular story you know lone survivor uh it was based on a book by marcus luttrell who actually ended up making a movie out of it who was directed by the great, one of my favorite directors of all times, Pete Berg. And of course, my favorite actor of all time, Mark Wahlberg. Big time. I love Mark Wahlberg. Love a lot of his movies. Huge fan of him. You know, it was definitely a great movie. Um, great actors. You know, Emil Hirsch, uh, uh, Ben Foster. You know, it was definitely a great cast. You know, uh, Marcus Luttrell was living in it. You know, it was definitely... Definitely a movie that really hit me um, from start to finish. You know, of course, there's a lot of sad stories about the military that a lot of us hasn't heard, heard about or, you know, it's maybe not a movie, but it's still a sad story. This one just really got to me because it actually made me cry and definitely things that I was expecting to happen didn't because it's a true story. It's not. Every ending might not be a happy ending, if you know what I mean. Now, this does have a happy ending, for, you know, because of the promise that Marcus Luttrell made to his brothers. And he kept that promise all the way to, to today. He's still keeping that promise. Now, like I said, I don't know all the facts to this, but I did wanted to do a video about this because I actually watched the movie again the other night and I started crying again. So I'm like, you know what? We got to do a video about this. So I talked about it with my producer, who is my fiance. <laughs> and I said, look, I would like to do a story about this. What do you think? And she said, first, you should try to reach out to Marcus Luttrell. You don't want to piss him off. You don't want to offend any family members or anything. I said, well, well, how would I do that? I'm not bad mouthing them or anything. And she was like, just out of respect, try to do that. I said, okay. So I went on Instagram and I found Mark Luttrell's Instagram and I redid send him a message like, hey, you know, I would love to interview you. You know, this is my YouTube channel, my videos, my podcast, Bad Habits Kingdom. And of course, you know, he's big time famous, has a bunch of followers and stuff. He didn't respond back, which isn't a surprise. But I at least did my part and I reached out and said, hey, I would like to do this. So. Now, Operation Red Wings. Now, Red Wings, of course, is the hockey team. Red Wing. I, I, I don't know if it's Red Wing or Red Wings. I think it's Wings with S. But come to find out, Navy SEALs. Now, first, let me talk about the Navy SEALs before I talk about Operation Red Wings. It's hard, it's hard for me to say Operation Red, Red Wings. I can't say. I'll just say RW. So, Navy SEALs. Bad ass. Okay, everybody in our military in all of our branches are badass people. If you're in the Navy, Army, you know, National Guard, whatever, you are a badass. But Navy SEALs are just a little bit more of a badass. Okay, these guys are like hardcore. If you know Navy SEALs, they got Captain Phillips, they got Bin Laden, they got, you know, they're the best. They're the best at what they do. You know, they are hardcore. When you meet a Navy SEAL, it's like, whoa, that's like a different level. That is a different level. I'll just say that. You know, the training they have to go through. I was actually watching videos on their training. And it's actually in the intro to the movie Lone Survivor where they're actually tied up by their feet and ankles, hands behind their back, and they're actually in a pool. I would freak out. I would freak out. It takes a special person to be a Navy SEAL. And I think everybody knows that by now. Not anyone can just be a Navy SEAL. It doesn't work that way. But they are the baddest at what they do. And they always are like in a small group. You know, they're never like 50 of them at one time or anything like that. They do missions in like real small groups. But that's why they're so good. They can do that. And they can make miracles happen. They can make the baddest things happen and come out on top. Okay, so Operation Red Wing. So basically, the mission was to kill or capture Hamid Shah. Now, he is a tier one target. They even talk about this in the movie, who basically runs militaries for Osama bin Laden. Okay, this guy is way up. Huge target. 
boom. So the mission starts out. They get dropped off in the middle of the night by the helicopter and take off. Now, there's two parts to this story. There's Marcus Luttrell's part, who actually did the book and did the movie and everything like that. And there's also Mohammed Gulab's part, who said, you know what? You know, the movie, someone wasn't all true but it's hollywood but we're gonna get into that in a little bit so the helicopter drops them off in the middle of the night they got a nice hike ahead of them then they get to the camp they actually identify muhammad shah or i'm sorry uh hamid shah i forgot i was about to say muhammad shah but hamid shah you know they identify him they send him back to headquarters and then they're getting ready to you know make their move or you know just waiting to for more information or just you know doing what seals do basically investigate then in all that mountain space a little small family an old man and two little kids well not one kid and a teenager who basically is a warrior in that day you know at that age stumbled upon them unfortunately now the Navy SEALs had them, you know, they had control of them. It wasn't like they had the, you know, they ran or anything like that. They had them and they didn't know what to actually do. So basically they didn't really vote, but they were talking about amongst themselves like, hey, we need to, what are we going to do? We go let them go where they can actually run down to the village, tell them where we're at, and then be on our asses in less than an hour or two, you know, tie them up, dip out where it's possible they can be eaten by animals or they can freeze to death or they can just terminate them. Marcus Luttrell actually said in many interviews that he actually said that he wanted to kill them. Now, I do agree with that. You know, it was told as well that Axe wanted to kill him, but in the movie it was saying that Axe wanted to do it, Marcus Luttrell didn't, and Danny Deeds didn't take a boat at all. He was just more like, you know, this is what we do, what we do, but if we do kill him, it's our business, you know, it's what we had to. And they end up taking a boat, and I think it came to grip to him that that's not what they are. They're U.S., they're, you know, military, they're... You know, seals, they're, you know, not murderers. You know, it's not what they were. It's not who they are. So then they let them go. I don't know why they didn't tie them up at least. I think they should have at least done that. But there's a reason why they let them go. And I respect their reason to let them go. You know, me personally, yes. It's easy for us to say, hey, yeah, you, you should kill him. It's easy for us to say, that we're not the ones just doing it. You know, it's easy to say that. But when you put a head to a, you know, gun to a kid or a knife because you can't be loud because the village is right down there with 100, 150 Taliban, you know, it's not easy. You know, so I really understood why they end up letting them go. So then they dip out. They still can't get comms up. Man, no radio contact. No signal because in the mountains over there, it's a really a pain in the ass. Even helicopters go down because of the signal and stuff like that, because of how the mountains are and everything. It's just really, really horrible when it comes to, you know, radio connections. I'll say that. So they end up walking a little bit. In less than an hour, the Taliban catches up to them. Now, I was under the impression for a little while that there was over 120 Taliban who uh, was actually attacking the four Navy SEALs. But it was actually Galab, who after Muhammad Galab, who actually saved Marcus Luttrell, who we're going to get into him in a minute, who actually came to America and saw the movie. You know, he was actually part of it and everything. And was like, that's not what happened. So now. The movie part is what I just told you about, and that's what's also Mark Luttrell's part. But Muhammad Galad said that that's not what happened. Basically, that's what happened. But the little, the old man and the teenager and the young boy with the that stumbled across them, they're not the reason why that the Taliban caught up to them or anything. They didn't go run down telling. The Taliban was already looking for them because they knew that they were there. Now, from Gulab saying that he said the night that the helicopter dropped them off, 
the Taliban and everyone in the area heard that. So they knew somebody was around. So then they went searching for them. They came across their footprints, chased them down, and found them. Now, I think it was more a Latrell story, honestly, because Gulab wasn't actually there with the Taliban when they were looking for him or anything like that. Marcus was. He was there. He experienced this. But there's one thing I'm going to say real quick about this story that really, really pisses me off. And it drives me nuts. There's actually live footage of this on YouTube. Of one of the Taliban men. Man, whatever you want to call him. Punk. That actually was recording all this. And it's actually on YouTube. And what gets me... I actually threw my phone. I broke my other phone. This is a different phone that I had. I had to go buy another phone because the one that's in pieces now because I broke it. So, But I got a new one and it's over on the counter. So <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. But you actually see them taking the soldiers gear, watch. And just like in that scene in the movie where Danny Dietz was dying and they took his wedding ring and trying it on. And they're just going through him while he's alive. I don't know if he was alive when they were doing that, but you actually see that for a second on the YouTube video. You see him taking off his watch. Just taking off his boots and laughing. I really hope that those guys that killed those seals and all those men are dead. I hope they killed all those Taliban. All of them. I get really emotional when I talk about this story. You know, like I said, it really hits home for me. So we're going to keep going. Where was I? Where was I? So there was two different stories about it. But like I said, Mark was there. He went through the experience. I believe his side more than I believe Muhammad Galab. So apparently from Marcus... There was over 100, 150. But I guess from video cameras and from what Gulab said and from Navy Navy experts or specialists, they actually found out there was about 30 to 40 Taliban that was actually attacking. And there was around 15, 16 that was the ones actually right on Marcus and his team. So I'm not sure. You know, I mean, that's still a lot. When you're talking about people shooting at you left and right. And what gives me goosebumps is I was watching this Marcus Latrell's own interview. And he was actually, they were actually watching the Taliban circling them. They can actually see them. And there's nowhere to go. They're all around them. That gave me goosebumps. Because there's, you know, no way out. You know, you're surrounded and you're watching them surround you. That is just a horrific feeling. I mean, I couldn't even imagine. In the video on YouTube, this is what really got to me. Gets to me. I actually watched it a couple times today before we did the video. And you can actually hear Mike Murphy yelling for help to Marcus. In the distance, he help Marcus. That got me. That really gets me. That really pisses me off. You know, these men are true heroes. Literally. You know, people thank me for my service because we're in the pandemic and I'm in the medical field, plasma industry, and people always say that to me. Thank you for your service. And I, the military, the ones that risk their lives every day for us. Thank them for their service and for their lives, their families, them. So, I'm going to jump a little bit, okay, because I don't want to end this video from crying. So I'm going to skip a couple things. And when we do part two of this video, I promise I'll be more prepared and more detailed and I'll try to keep my cool. So 
one by one, the SEAL team is being picked apart. They're dying. There's way too many. They're being they're out in number. They're running low on ammunition. But they got a lot of them. Me, personally, I think if they had the ammunition and they were in better ground because they're shooting up. They're going down the mountain while the Taliban is just all around them on top. So they could see them perfectly. And they're shooting up. They're trying to hide. They're going down so they can't see behind them. It's a hill. I mean, that is just a horrible place to be around. All just all the way around. That is just horrible because the Taliban is just pretty much over you. They can see you nonstop. There's not really good places to hide. These seals were being not just shot once. They were shot up, each of them, and still fighting. They were still standing there fighting them. It wasn't like, oh, I'm hit. You know, I surrender. They were going after them. I'm hit. But I'm doing I'm in this freaking fight. Let's do it. Those seals are hard. They are the baddest. Um, Danny Dietz was shot, I think, three times in the chest, twice in the neck, in the head, in the groin, the stomach, his ankle, his Achilles heel. That's what it took to kill him. That's what it took. That is one badass seal. That's a, that. That's hard. That is heart. That is everything. Courage. You know, loyalty to your brothers. I mean, everything. That's what that is. He lived it. We we talk about loyalty. We talk about courage and honor and everything. Those men actually lived all of it. They were loyal to each other. They were courage. They had heart. They had love. They had passion. They had each other. And it's just amazing. They had everything we want. They lived it. Everything we talk about. We might say we have it. We might say we would do it. Or we would do this. They did it. You know. Me personally. If I get shot once. I'm like. Oh, I'm done. Not with these guys. It took. Multiple bullets to stop them. Multiple. Headshots. I don't know if it's true. I don't have evidence or I wasn't told confirmation or anything. In the movie Axe, Matthew Axe Axe was shot in the head and still fighting. He was still fighting getting shot in the head. Mike Murphy knew what was going to happen to him. He knew he had to make a call to get his brothers out of there. He knew the only way to get that call connected is he had to go on a cliff, rock area. In the open, no cover. But that's the only way he knew that the, he, his brothers, his brothers, not him. That his brothers had a chance to survive. Didn't think twice about it. He went and did it. Gave his life. And the last thing he said. On the phone. Was thank you. Told them where they were. Got the help coming. They, and when he hung up the phone. He said thank you. And that was it. So when I first saw the movie. Like I said. It's a true story. When I saw those seals coming, I thought, man, these four seals just blasted a bunch of these guys. Now a whole seal team, you know, 16 of them are on the way. These Taliban are done. They're going to swipe all those Taliban out. If four of them are already getting all, most of them, 16 is going to take it over. But it's a true story. 
That's what we wanted to see. That's what we were hoping for. When I first saw the movie, I was like, that's what I thought. I was like, oh, yeah, they, these Taliban are done. Until an RPG came and took out the chopper. And killed 16 men. American lives. That went to go help save their brothers. Who was pissed off. Who was worried. And who was ready. They didn't even get a chance. Because of a punk ass freaking Taliban with the RPG Shane Patton actually lived out here in Nevada lived about 30 minutes away in Boulder City I wish I uh, wish I knew him you know that's Shane Patton the, you know the rookie seal in the movie real person true story lived in Boulder City it's about 20 minutes away from here. All he wanted was a fight. And serve next to other SEALs. He was excited. Their commander was pissed off. Trying to get his men out of there. One of the worst tragedies. 19 SEALs. Marcus lost all of his teammates, all of them. He was all alone out there in the mountains with all those Taliban. He's coming at him, all of them, for him. He crawled. He had bullets all over him. He broke his back, face all messed up. RPG went through, you know, blasted his leg. You know. He crawled for hours and hours and hours. He even said in an interview, he was so thirsty, he would have killed somebody just for water. You know, he actually had to go through that. Can you imagine how terrifying that had to have been? Any minute you're going to get, you know, you're, you're surrounded by enemies. They already killed your entire team. All of them. All your friends. All your brothers. And all of them are coming for you. Marcus finds water. Puts his whole body in it. Drinking it. In severe pain, of course. You gotta remember, he shot up. I mean, broke his back. He knocked himself out multiple times. You know. Then he hears somebody talking right behind him. And he freaks out. Turns around, sees someone there, goes, grabs his gun, then he looks behind him again, and there's his buddy Mahalo Gulab. Now Mahalo Gulab, of course, looks like a threat at first. You know, it's, it's Afghanistan. You know, he's got, you know, he's Afghani. You know, Marcus was like, let's go. He ain't sur he's not going to surrender. So he's like, let's go. Pulls out the grenade. He has his gun basically right here, aimed at Gulab, and Gulab's like, Tells him, not in English, but basically lets Marcus know that he's not a threat. He's a friend. Hey, man, I got you. F the Taliban. Come on. I don't know why. Nobody really does. I mean, he, he's just a good-hearted person to help an American. No one what that can cost you. He didn't think twice about it. Now, when Marcus saw Gulab, he was about to kill him. He wanted to kill him. He's like, hey, you know, I mean, he had his gun on him, hand on the trigger, had the grenade and pin out. Like, we're going. If I'm going, we're, we're all going. True story. That's what he was about to do. But Gulab let him know that he wasn't a threat and that he was going to help him. So, basically, Muhammad Gulab... Has a comes from a village that has like a thousand year or two thousand year law. So basically, anyone that enters that village, or I guess you won't say enter the village, but someone from that village offers assistance, or if you ask them for help, I think you actually have to ask them for help. And that's what Marcus did. Will you help me? And the guy said yes. And they would actually protect you, be with you the entire time, and 
fight for you as well. They will risk their lives for you and protect you, whatever, because they basically offering you the, their service. And that's what Galab did. He stood by it. Now, he ends up taking Marcus back to his little village and get him some food, clean up. Other people in the village were a little hesitant, like, you know, this is kind of weird. Now, this is not in the movie, but this is what happened. So, basically, the Taliban is show up to the village. And they're like, hey, give us the American, you know, give them to us. Galab said, no, he's my guest. I'm taking care of him. He's with me. You know, you can't have him. And they're arguing back and forth. And then an elder from the village, an elder man, basically, I guess you could say the chief of the village, came up and was like, no, you know, I'm going to back Gulab up. We're going to take care of the American. We're going to offer him our assistance. You know, he's with us. You know, we're going to protect him. You can't have him. Then they parted ways. Basically, they let him know, like, hey, we're not going to give them to you. The Taliban didn't just murder them like they were go- like in movies and stuff like that that you see. The Taliban knew that, that they were innocent people, and sometimes it's not good just to kill innocent people. But they wanted the American, and it wasn't going to go easy, and they weren't going to give up either. So basically, they left. They go tell Shah, hey, he's down there. And during this time... Shah's men, the Taliban, are getting all of the equipment, all of the gear. Even in the video on YouTube, you can see them with the night goggles, and they're talking about how it's the best thing in the world because you can see at night. Shah picks up Danny Dietz's gun like a trophy. One dude was putting on his boots and smiling. They need to take that video off, down off YouTube. That video should not be out there for the families to see. Anyone should, no one should see that. <laughs> I mean, God, that pisses me off. So, Shaw comes back to the village and says, hey, you know, this is what we'll do. Give us the American, we'll give you some money. You know, he knows the village doesn't have any money. We'll give you some money, give us the American. You know, we're not going to kill him. We're going to use them to basically transfer prisoners that the Americans had. That's basically what he was telling Galab. Shah was telling Galab that, hey, we're not going to kill him, but we are going to trade him for prisoners to uh, the American have of the Taliban. We're just going to swap them out. Me personally, I think they would have killed Marcus. You know, they killed all the SEALs already. Um, so I think they would have killed him. So, Galab stands his ground. No, I don't want your money. I don't want anything. You're not going to have him. So then, Shaw comes back and says, okay, either give us the American or you die. Not just you, but your family, people in your village. You're dead. What does Galab do? Tells him no. That's heart. That's loyalty. That's courage. Just like the seals. That's what that is. (laughs) It's remarkable. What he did to keep Marcus alive. But he knew Marcus was in danger. Now, he knows he has to get Marcus out of there. So, about five days after the initial attack, after Shaw killed him, they're moving Marcus around. You know, they're carrying him pretty much because he broke his back. They took his military clothes off. He has an Afghani, you know, gown on, Afghani hat. Maybe tried to blend him in a little bit. Um, but Marcus actually wrote a letter, you know, to the military and had, and one of Galab's guys actually went and took it to the military guys like, Hey, I'm alive. Can you get me now special ops, special ops had to go do the recovery for the plane that was down and for the Navy seals that went missing that were, you know, believed to be dead. Um, they end up at the crash site of all the, of the helicopter crash 
well, not crash, but that was shot down. And they got all 16 of the bodies of the SEALs and other military men that were involved in that helicopter going down. <sighs> they got them. Then they get word why they're doing this, that there's an American alive. Okay, so that this time, this is basically where Galab's guy got to Galab. I'm wondering if I'm saying that right. If I'm not saying that correctly, I do apologize. Galab's guy got to the military, U.S. military, gave him a note from Marcus, and now Special Ops hears about it. Okay, there's American alive. We got the word. Let's go get them. So Special Ops starts walking, and they actually go the same route that Marcus and his team went. And they didn't see anyone along the way. Anybody. Nothing. They didn't see the bodies of the other SEALs. They didn't see the Taliban. Nothing. They end up arriving to where Marcus was. And at first, they didn't know. They didn't know what was going on. They just knew America was in danger. So they had everybody on the ground. They were breaking in doors. You know, they, you know, making, you know, basically making sure they have control of the situation. Then they find Marcus. He's in an Afghani gown, Afghani hat. And then they ask him, you know, what's going on? Where's the rest of your team? Where's the enemy? Where are the bad guys? He said, they're all around us, man. They're all over. Okay. Where's the rest of your team? They're dead. They're dead. Then they start talking about, you know, which way did you come from? Which way did you go? Everything like this. Now, remind you, Marcus has a broke his back, busted nose, shot. You know, RPG hit his leg. I mean, it didn't go through him, but, you know, shattered his leg. I mean, he is tore up. But he's sitting there talking to these guys just so they could pass intel and, you know, get on the right page. And Marcus Luttrell asks them, how many guys do you have with you? You know, because we're still in the middle of this. These guys are, like I said, they're all around us. And they've been coming after me. They've been coming back to, to get me. How many guys you got with you? You got about 15. And the guy laughed and was like, well, no. You got about, you know, 20? Uh, we started out with that. But some of them are back at this, you know, crash site. I got 11 with me. <laughs> okay. But they did it. And they got Marcus out of there. And they got him home. What I didn't know is after Marcus landed, got home safely, healed up, he went back to the teams and went back to duty. I thought when he got home, that was it. I didn't know that he actually went back because he wanted to. A lot of people, what bothers me when they say, when they talk about Marcus Luttrell or uh, Chris Kyle or Chris O'Donnell, any, any, Navy SEALs or Marines when they say former Marcus Luttrell former Navy SEAL what what do you mean by former how would you consider him a former Navy SEAL he's a Navy SEAL now and forever all those men are Navy SEALs not former all those men are Marines not former This story really, really gets me every time, you know, and I know I missed a lot in the video. I didn't go over every single detail, but I promise you on part two of this video, I will. I would definitely get more intel or intel. <laughs> Let me, I'm trying to be like him. Um, after I read the book, the book will be here in two to three days. I'm going to read the book. I'm going to try to look into the thing and you never know. Make it, maybe Marcus Luttrell will respond back and come on the show. We can do a Zoom, Zoom interview because I know he lives in Texas and I live in Vegas. So I just want to say thank you to all the men and women who ever served in the service. Given their life, given years of their life, given all their years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because of you, I have a beautiful family. Because of you, I have a nice job. Because of you, who give all of us a chance to have a free life, it's because of you. And I am so grateful for you. I, I, I love you guys. Women and men, I, I love you guys for serving in our service and serving in the military. 
and I can't thank you enough. In Operation Red Wings and all the other operations that turned out tragic for our men and women, you'll never be forgotten. We love you, we all miss you, and you will be remembered. You might not have a movie named after you, you might not have a book after you, but you will not be forgotten. You gave your life for us to live. You gave years of your life for us to live. And I wish there was more I can do than just saying thank you. That's going to be it for tonight's video, guys. I do appreciate if you watched it this far. I do appreciate your guys' support and for subscribing to the channel. Remember, if you would like a free Bad Habits Kingdom t-shirt, go ahead and email, email me at badhabitsking at gmail.com. And, like I said, if you would like to help donate to get some toys for the kids at the Children's Hospital, go to the GoFundMe account in the link below. Every donation counts. A little goes a long way. Also, check us out on TikTok, Instagram, Spotify, Apple, all of it, baby. We got it all. Definitely check us out on Instagram and TikTok, Spotify, and Apple. And hit subscribe if you're not subscribed yet. Thank you, kings and queens. I love you guys so much for supporting the channel and for all your support and for watching the videos. I love you guys. You guys have a great night.